Uh, my name is Jean Remel. I work in the Office of Admissions, and I am here simply to help host this webinar. More importantly, we are joined tonight by Professor Tober from our Department of Sociology. Now, that being said, I do want to let you all know that there's a Q&A feature in Zoom, and you can use that to submit your questions at any point in time. So I encourage you to ask questions, really engage. It's what this is all about. But again, if you have any questions, feel free to put those directly into the Q&A. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and disappear. And Professor, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, let me share my screen. OK. So, um, okay, um, we're all set. So today we are going to talk about economic inequality and insecurity in the United States. Um, first, I guess I would, I should introduce myself. My name is Dr. Tara Tober and I'm a lecturer here in the sociology department. Um, I, I guess I would first, should first do is define sociology. It's a field, it's a department. So whatever you know, university you end up attending, hopefully it's here, um, there will probably be a sociology department. Here at UCSB, we're a very big major, very popular major. Um, basically, sociology is the study of society and social problems. So this is a really broad field. Uh, we study everything from individual behaviors like, you know, if and you know whether you attend college to macro level processes such as revolutions. Um, and we have sociologists who study race, gender, culture, you name it, a sociologist can, can probably study it. It's important to note though that the study of inequality in particular in, is sort of the backbone of sociology. So uh, many of our founders were interested in various forms of inequality, but especially class inequality. Um, so I'd actually like to start with a local story. So something that's going on in Santa Barbara right now, sort of as a starting point for, for beginning this lecture. Because I think it's, this, it's a great example of inequality in the US and the forms of inequality that I'd like to talk about today. It starts with the Biltmore Hotel in Santa Barbara. You can see this is a beautiful hotel. The, you know, you were just looking at pictures of our campus, which is amazing. Every, everything around here is beautiful. <laughs> but you can see the Biltmore, you have the mountains in the background, the oceans just on the other side out of view in the, in the photo. And this Biltmore Hotel is owned by Ty Warner. Um, and it's also, it's owned by Ty Warner and it's managed by the Four Seasons. And the Four Seasons is owned by Bill Gates, who of course is the founder of Microsoft and Saudi Arabia's Prince Alawid bin Talal. Now, if you don't know who Ty Warner is, he is an American millionaire and founder of Beady Babies. And if you're unfamiliar, they are those little stuffed animals that were a major fad in the mid to late 90s. I am old enough to remember this fad. Ty Warner lives here in Santa Barbara. And in addition to owning the luxurious Biltmore Hotel, that will be the subject here um, in Santa Barbara, he is also the owner of the Four Seasons Hotel in New York, the Sandpiper Golf Course in Goleta, the San Isidro Ranch in nearby Montecito, which is a luxury hotel and resort. And he also owns properties in Hawaii and Mexico. So the stuffed animal business was very good in the 90s. <laughs> um, notably, he was also sentenced to two years probation for tax evasion. He maintained an offshore account in Switzerland, which held over $100 million. So last March, when the COVID shutdowns began in March, 2020, about 650 employees of the Biltmore Hotel were out of work. Some were able to collect unemployment, but many of the employees were not US citizens, so they were unable to receive many of those benefits. So as of May, 2020, employees were left with no health insurance in the midst of a pandemic, no benefits and no income. The worst part 
is that they were not laid off, nor were they terminated, but they were furloughed. Furloughed is something different. So furloughed is defined as a temporary loss of employment. And the difference between a furlough and a layoff or a termination has to do with the company's obligation to pay its former employees severance packages. So when you furlough employees, you do not have to pay their severance packages because it's not permanent. It's a temporary um, layoff. It's a temporary layoff, right? So the workers were told that they weren't told much, <laughs> but when, when they were told something, they were told that the hotel would open back up when it was safe and they would be back to work. Okay. So the employees, some of them who had worked there for 10, 20, even 40 years, waited for the hotel to reopen. I read about Roberto Santana, who had worked there for about 43 years. At 61 years old, he is worried that it would be difficult for him to find another job, especially with the COVID crisis. So the employees, they waited and they watched as other hotels in Santa Barbara opened. They waited and watched while Ty Warner opened his other hotels, including the San Isidro Ranch, which is nearby. And they received no communication from either Ty Warner or Four Seasons. So the employees began holding protests starting in August and are now trying to take legal action because they're sort of held in this holding period, right? They're not, they're, they're not being fired or terminated um, and they're not being brought back to work. They're being furloughed. Interestingly, the employee handbook at the Biltmore prohibits class action lawsuits. So this, this issue, right, this is trying to be settled through mediation, and the mediation actually takes place this April, next week on April 30th. So stay tuned. I'll be interested to see what happens with these employees. But the bigger question is, why is this hotel not reopening? Ty Warner says it's under construction, but it's not. And there are rumors, right? People are speculating why this has happened. The Biltmore has canceled all events through 2023, which doesn't look good for the employees. And that is also when Warner's contract with the Four Seasons ends. So Warner says that the hotel is closed for construction, but many believe this is just an excuse as it is a contractually allowed reason for the resort to be closed. So the speculation is that Ty Warner is just trying to wait out his contract with the Four Seasons so he can um, have a new management company. He wants to end his relationship with the Four Seasons. Nobody is saying much, but that's sort of what people are guessing. And so while we're playing this game of billionaire chicken, right, both the Four Seasons company and Ty Warner can weather the Biltmore being closed for another two years. But as this is going on, hundreds of people, the hundreds of employees and their families at the Biltmore are suffering. They're left without pay, without knowing if they will have a job, and again, without health insurance during this pandemic. So I'm telling you this story to highlight the disconnect, the very real disconnect between the haves, right, top 1%, maybe top half a percent in this country and the, ha and the rest of us and the have-nots in the United States. So I have many examples for you today. So I want to look, we're going to look at lots of data and, and sort of examples of this, this disconnect. And now, I, many of you are probably sick of hearing about COVID, but I, I do, <laughs> you know, it is something that I, I will want to give one more example of as, as an example of this disconnect. So at the close of 2020, which, right, we can all agree was the worst year, a year of human misery, a year of human suffering, economic uncertainty, layoffs. But you might also remember hearing a little bit um, that financial markets actually boomed in 2020. That's correct. I can, I can send you or send um, Jane the article to link to, but the New York Times reported in January 2021 that while 3,000 people were dying a day and 800,000 people were filing for unemployment each week, markets were booming. 
asset prices were high, housing market boomed, and on average, personal income and savings actually increased. Wages, on the other hand, did not decrease by as much as you might think. So here I have this graph for you. Um, it's from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. So you can see unemployment insurance benefits. And this is, comes from the CARES Act, which you may have heard of, or you may have even been a recipient of. Um, so this is the unemployment benefits that some Americans were able to get, but not all. Um, and this was good, right? Now for a white collar employee or a, or a professional, unemployment benefits would probably le be less than an average paycheck. But for many workers, the unemployment benefit that they got was more than the wages they earned at their low wage jobs. Now, we might say like, oh, that's a good thing, but it's, a, I guess it depends on whether or not you're a half full or a half empty kind of a person. Because I also think, you know, when, it, when I remember learning about this and thinking, it means that people are getting paid too little for the work that they're doing. So you had income from the stimulus checks, you had uh, proprietor's income, which um, would have been negative without the Paycheck Protection Program, which helped businesses, all other income. Okay, now if you look down here, you see wages at negative 43 billion, which <laughs> is a lot, but maybe it's less than you would expect considering, you know, what happened last year. And this seems impossible, right? Everything was shut down for most of the year. This data is from March through November. Um, you know, restaurants were shut down. There was no travel. Services were done, right? You couldn't go and, and do all the normal things that you did. Millions were out of work. So how is something like this possible? How can we even, how can we have this data? According to the New York Times, um, it has to do with the types of jobs that were lost because of the pandemic. Um, according to the New York Times, the millions of people no longer working because of the pandemic were disproportionately in lower wage, lower paying service jobs. Higher paid professionals were largely able to work from home or work remotely, and so they were less affected. For example, when this data is calculated, if, for example, you had a corporate executive who got a $100,000 bonus for keeping the company afloat during a difficult year, while at the same time, four restaurant workers who each earn $25,000 a year are laid off, the net effect on this sort of data is zero, right? The two cancel each other out, even though in human terms, a great deal of pain has been caused. So through this pandemic, we saw the incomes of CEOs like Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, rise amidst this crisis. We saw wealthy urban dwellers purchase homes in areas like Montecito to escape the city. Um, and we also saw wealthy families pull their kids out of public schools and enroll them in private schools because so that to avoid um, Zoom school, right? Because the private schools were given waivers and allowed to open in person. And what all of this did was it exacerbated already extreme inequities that exist in the United States, right? It made all of this inequality much worse. Okay, so let's think about how much inequality is there. Okay, now before I give you some data on how much inequality there is in the United States, I first want to give you some data on how much inequality Americans think there is. So not how much there actually is, but basically we have a couple of economists. They surveyed and they did a representative survey. So it represents Americans broadly. So it include all different kinds of people across the income spectrum, all different races, genders, education levels, political views, okay? So they surveyed Americans and they asked them, what do you think the wealth gap looks like in the United States? How much wealth do you think the top 20% of earners have, the second 20% of Americans have, right? The middle 20%, 
right? So looking at quintiles. And this is what Americans estimated. They said, okay, I think on average, this is what Americans responded. They said, I think that the top 20% of Americans control about 60% of the wealth. And that the second 20% controls about 20% of the wealth. The middle 20% controls about 10 to 12% of the wealth. Fourth, uh, the next 20% of Americans controlling about five or so percent, and the bottom 20% with about two or 3% of the wealth. Okay. Okay, great. And so then they, these economists asked the, ask these Americans in their survey, what would be ideal? So, what would an ideal society look like for you? What would the wealth gaps look like in an ideal society? And this is what Americans said, right? Americans in general are okay with a little bit of inequality. And we can see that here. So you notice that people didn't say that they thought everybody should have exactly the same amount of wealth. It's probably, um, you know, not really feasible. So they said, I, so this is what they estimated. They think, I think, they said, I think the top 20% of earners control about 60% um, of the wealth. But they said, ideally, the top 20% of Americans would control about half that. They would control about 30% of the wealth. And now they probably wouldn't have put it this way, but basically what they did is they took some of the income here, that wealth here, and they said it should be, you know, put down here. <laughs> um, now, they didn't say anything about what measures they would support to make this happen, but the point is, they said, ideally, the wealth gaps would look like this. They thought that they looked like this, and they said, ideally, the wealth gaps looked like this. What's interesting is that this is what the wealth gaps actually look like. So the top 20% of Americans control about 85% of the wealth. The next 20% control about 10. The middle 20% controls about 5% of the wealth. And the bottom 40% doesn't even register on this. They control so little, right? And by wealth, that means that's not just your income, we're talking wealth. So it means um, your owning a home is part of your wealth. Any investments you might have or stocks or 401k, all of these things are wealth. And so in the United States, we have a lot of income inequality. And if I showed you this data using income, which we have, but um, it would look a little different. It wouldn't be as extreme, but it's still very much. But wealth inequality is a huge problem in the United States as the wealthy just keep, there's a lot of social reproduction, we would say. Um, wealthy people have children, their children have wealth, their children have wealth, and it just keeps accumulating. So this shows that there is a wealth gap between the rich and the poor in the United States and that this is it's a very wide gap and it's actually much more wide than other countries that look a lot like us, right? So if we were looking at other European countries or other advanced economies, um, you know, their wealth gaps, they, they have wealth gaps as well, but they're not nearly as severe as ours. But sometimes there's this perception that inequality in the US is relative and not that, ba not that bad. Um, this is the idea that being poor in the US isn't as bad as being poor in say another country. And so, and, may, and maybe this makes sense. You can understand this thinking. So you might think, well, I'd rather be poor in the United States than be poor in you know, a country that really is suffering, right? That it, um, like a country maybe like Haiti or a, you know, a place like this. So, and maybe that's true, but here's the thing. Poor people in the US, they don't live somewhere else, right? They live here. They live in the United States, which is supposed to be a meritocracy. It's supposed to be a land of equal opportunity. Um, it's supposed to be one of the wealthiest countries in the world. We certainly have enough, right? There is enough to go around there. We have enough food to feed everyone. We should have enough housing to house everyone. So, 
And I would also say to sort of this perception that inequality in the US isn't as bad as it, as it is in other places, is that the United States definitely has levels of absolute poverty that rivals in other impoverished nations. And it doesn't necessarily ex exist where you might think. And we know that many in the audience are in California. Um, and so you may be, you may not be familiar, or you may, um, with the geographical area known as Appalachia. Um, and it's the area of the Appalachian Mountains, um, sort of ranging from the Northeast Midwest all the way down to the South. So the Appalachian Mountains run through here. And this is sort of the region known as Appalachia. It extends from Southern New York. I'm from, I'm from right here, from Buffalo. Um, and, um, and I've also lived down here in Virginia. And so this is this area. So um, Appalachia is an area that has been experiencing chronic poverty for decades. So it's a rural area with extreme levels of poverty. So here I'm giving you some data. We have not, this is data from 1960. Um, and there were 295 high poverty counties in in Appalachia. And what that means, a high poverty county is a county with at least 1.5 times the US average. And what's important to note is because these are rural areas, there's not a lot there. There's not a lot of resources. Um, there's, so you don't, you, the people living there often have lack of access to certain things. <coughs> and so this is the same region in 2010. So you can see 50 years later, we have a lot of improvement. We only have 116 high poverty counties as opposed to 295. But what you can also see is this persistent inequality in largely in Eastern Kentucky, uh, Western West Virginia and, and Western Virginia. And then also again, down here in Mississippi. And I also have more recent data. This is from 2019. So again, an improvement from 2010 to 2019, you, where you have 80 counties instead at the distressed level. But again, those 80 counties are in this same area that has been distressed for a very long time. So there, there has been improvement. And these improvements are the work of local, state, and government programs, social workers. Churches also do a lot of work in this area and help poor people living there. But again, many of these areas are still suffering. We also have extreme poverty in our cities. Um, so Flint, Michigan, for example, still does not have clean drinking water. They are close to replacing all of the lead pipes in the city, but have not yet completed the work. Inner cities are defined as distressed urban areas of concentrated poverty, low income, and unemployment. Inner cities often use as sort of this catch all phrase, but it actually has a very specific meaning. So, and, and so this infographic basically just has some information about inner cities, how many people are living in, in our cities, um, and that some of the levels of poverty are, are extreme in these areas. Beyond that, um, it's important to recognize that um, there are also many Americans who may not be living in extreme poverty, but who are right on the edge. So this is a group that often tends to be ignored. So we may talk about, and rightfully so, right? The, we may talk about Appalachia, inner cities, our homeless populations, but there's also a rather large group known as the working poor. Um, and these are people who are working in low wage, often surface work, often working multiple jobs, and they are making ends meet, but they are one accident or incident from away from poverty. So let me give you an example. Let's say you have a single mom and she has two kids and she works two jobs and she makes enough money to pay her bills and how she's able to do this, because I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, how does she pay for childcare? And that would be a good question because childcare is insane. But her mother lives with her and her mother watches her kids when they get home from school. Okay. So she's doing okay. 
She, she works her jobs. She's at work a lot, but she's working hard. She's making ends meet. Her mom watches the kids. Things are okay for now. She's not saving. Okay. Everything that comes in goes out, but she's doing okay. And then what happens if mom gets, if her mother gets sick, maybe her mom has an accident. Maybe her mom has cancer. Maybe her mom needs to be hospitalized. And all of a sudden she's lost her childcare and she has no safety net, right? She hasn't been able to accumulate any savings. And suddenly she's put at, at great risk. She might lose her job if she doesn't go to work, but she can't leave her kids home alone. So she's trying to figure out what to do. And this is the, an example of someone who might slip into poverty. Um, and this is actually what, when we look at the people who use um, sort of what, what we think of as welfare, right, or um, entitlements, that's often what happens is that something happens and they slip below the poverty threshold. They're able to, they use um, sort of government programs, right, childcare programs, um, women, infants, and children, right, to help pay for things like diapers and formula, stuff like that. They get themselves back on their feet and then come out of, out of that poverty threshold. That's how the vast majority of people who um, are using welfare, that's how they, they use it. Um, so there's this big chunk of Americans who are living, they're not living in poverty, but they're living in uncertainty, right? They don't have, because they don't have savings, they don't have reliable cars. So even a car breaking down can be absolutely devastating for a family like this one, that this example that I gave you. Okay, so I'm hoping I've convinced you that there's inequality in the U.S., um, but isn't there a lot of social mobility? So when I say social mobility, what I mean is something that's called intergenerational social mobility. And all that means is that kids, the ability for kids to end up in a different class position from their parents, okay? So this is what um, I think probably many of your parents and many of you are hopeful for some of you in the audience may be first generation college students and so your parents worked hard and then you worked hard and the, the idea is that then you go to college and you'll be a little bit better off than your than your parents were um, so inequality and social mobility are two different things you could have a society with a high level of inequality that also, theoretically, you could have this, that has a high level of inequality and also a high level of mobility. So you have a lot of difference between top earners and bottom earners, but you also have lots of people moving up and down the social ladder, right, the social hierarchy. Um, okay, so when we're talking about mobility, we might think of somebody like Sonia Sotomayor, who's amazing, okay? She is, of course, a Supreme Court Justice on the United States. And we may think that because Sonia Sotomayor, who grew up, uh, she's a poor, she grew up poor, Puerto Rican woman, right? Who grew up in housing projects in South Bronx. And because she was able to become a Supreme Court Justice that, Maybe we do have an, you might think that, you know, thinking of her as an example, maybe we do have inequality, but we also have mobility, high levels of mobility. And this is the idea that if you work hard, you can achieve anything or at least something, <laughs> maybe not anything. Um, but, and the accomplishments of Sotomayor are great and evidence that the world is changing. For sure, you know, she would not have been able to be a Supreme Court justice even 20, 30 years ago. Um, but she is only one amazing person. Sotomayor's accomplishments, although great, it's important to note that she does not represent the life chances of all disadvantaged groups. So when I see an example like her as a sociologist, I think, what happened to all the hundreds of other children who grew up alongside her in those projects? Or the thousands that live in similar conditions or worse in cities throughout the US? 
it's possible then that she's the exception and not the rule. Well, and social scientists, they've tried to answer this question, right? Social scientists have asked, right? Sociologists and economists have studied how much mobility is there in the United States and who is able to move? Okay, so, and I want you to note that when I was defining so intergenerational, means parents to children, social mobility, I said that the, in order for mobility to exist, kids need to be able to end up in a different class position than their parents. Notice that I didn't say they needed to be able to end up in a higher class position than their parents. Because in order for a society to be mobile, people need to be able to move up, which is something we like, but also people need to be able to move down, okay? That is, you can't have everybody moving up, right? It's not possible. People also, for a truly mobile and open society, it also needs to be possible for people, for elites to have children that then do not become elite. And that we'll find out is much harder. Okay, so how much social mobility is there in the US? Again, let's start with how much mobility Americans think there is and sort of their perceptions of how mobile of a society the United States is, okay? So first, um, this is from the Pew Research Center. Um, Americans, as you may have heard this, Americans have, there were a very individualistic society, okay? There's sort of a rampant individualism that exists here. Um, and Americans stand out on individualism. So you can see compared to other. This is percent of people who disagree that success in life is pretty much determined by forces outside our control. Um, in India, you can see 27% of people disagree with this, whereas 57%, only 27% of, um, in, of people living in India disagree with this, and 57, almost 60% of Americans disagree with this. And this is the percent who say it's very important, 10 on a 0 to 10 scale, to work hard to get ahead in life. So again, you have People in other countries are saying, yes, of course, it's, it's important to work hard to get ahead. Um, but in the US, 73% agree with that statement. So, and you can see this is on a scale from less individualistic societies to more individualistic societies. And so I think this is super interesting data. So Americans think that how you end up your success is not determined by forces outside our control, such as whether or not you graduate from college in the middle of a global pandemic, <laughs> which will certainly impact seniors this year. This is certainly going to impact their earnings. Um, you know, all these sorts of things, they sort of do not think that that is that important. Okay, then this is, um, this is one of my favorites. Okay, so this is perceptions of mobility and actual mobility. So here on this axis, you have average perceived pro, um, mobility, right? So this is the perception that you will be mobile. And so in the US, we are very optimistic. We're like, yes, we will be mobile. This is great. People can achieve upward mobility if they work hard. You can see Italy, UK, France, right? They are very pessimistic. They are saying no, um, they are less optimistic than Americans, right? If you're looking at this axis here. This axis is the actual, right? Levels of mobility, right? So the US, this is funny because they think that, um, they sort of think that there's a lot of mobility and there isn't, they have, we have the least compared to these other countries. So we have the least mobility, but we're the most optimistic about it. Whereas other countries have more mobility, but they're more pessimistic about it. <laughs> and actually there's really cool historical explanations for these differences between the US and European countries. I'm not gonna get into them, but if you take my class, we'll, we'll talk about it. 
Um, okay, then here we, and this, oh, I should tell you, this is data from a paper titled Intergenerational Mobility by a group of economists at Harvard and Northwestern. Okay, this is also great. So this is actual versus perceived mobility. So one thing that is important to note is that there are geographical differences. So here is actual probability um, of mobility where you have, oh, sorry, um, my chat thing was. So with these, um, areas in white sort of having not a lot of mobility. So this, the, again, this is the area of Appalachia you have here, and just in general, Southern United States having not very much mobility, but they perceive mobility to be very high. So Americans are over optimistic in general about mobility, but they are particularly over optimistic about social mobility in parts of the country where actual mobility is especially low. And Americans are pessimistic about mobility where mobility is actually high, like the North and Northwest. Okay, so that's a really interesting finding. Okay, so let's look now at how mobility is measured. Oh, I. Okay, mobility is measured. We're going to look at how it's measured and what the data look, look like. Okay, so again, most of the time we're talking about intergenerational mobility, which um, again is from parents to children. So we're looking at from one generation to the next. And how it's, and it can, this can be measured in lots of different ways. The US in general has average rates of social mobility. So if anybody said to you like, oh, the US has tons of mobility, they would be wrong. And if, if somebody said to you and said, oh, the US has no mobility, you know, it's just, it's really hard to get ahead or anything like that, they would also be wrong, okay? The US actually, when you take the US as a whole, it has average rates of mobility compared to other countries. But the story is more complex than that. Um, the standard that is used to measure mobility is called intergenerational income elasticity. Okay, that sounds very scary, but it's not. And what it does is it captures the statistical connection between parents' income and their children's income later in life. So what's the connection between how much money your parents make and how much money you will make? Okay, the higher the value of IGE, okay, um, the greater the connection between parents' income and children's income, which then means less social mobility. So the higher the number means the greater the connection between the two, between parents' income and children's income, which means low levels of mobility. So think high numbers are bad if you like social mobility. Okay, so here we have, this is data. Um, but this is intergenerational income elasticity, IGE, by income, okay? And I'm, don't worry, I'm going to explain this. This is from a 2019 paper. So what this, this is the IGE. So remember, high, higher numbers are bad. It's on a scale from zero to one, and higher numbers are bad, meaning that there is less mobility, and lower numbers are good. And we're just going to be concentrating on these black dots, okay? And this down here is income. So here you have the Americans who are in the lowest, right? Who are our lowest income earners, our lowest earners. And here you have our highest earners. So one thing you'll see here is that um, at our lowest earners, we have higher EGE, right? IGE, that's the EGE, IGE. So that means that at, for the lowest incomes, the effect of parent income is the highest, right? So having parents with really low income means that it's, it's much harder and less likely for you to be upwardly mobile. And then as you move up and you get to the middle classes, that IGE decreases. And this makes sense, okay? So the people in here, the examples, what you're going to have are, for example, um, I, I know I'm, I think I'm almost out of time, but I, I'll, I'll be quick, um, is say you have 
um, dad works at a factory and mom is, is an administrative assistant. They both have good jobs, neither went to college. And then they have a child who's able to go to college and becomes a teacher. That person is upwardly mobile, would be considered upwardly mobile by a little bit. They'll probably have higher incomes. They might, the odds are they'll marry another, uh, another person, maybe another teacher or a person with a college degree, and they will in general have higher incomes than their parents. And again, people can move down. We're, we're looking at working class here, middle class and upper middle class. So let's say mom and dad are both doctors and they have a child and that child become, goes to college and becomes a teacher. And I'm not, I, you know, I'm not saying anything bad about teachers, but um, according to this, they would be considered slightly downwardly mobile because doctors on average earn more than teachers. Um, and they sort of have a higher prestige level. So be considered downwardly mobile, but not much. So we're seeing more levels of inequality in the middle, right? Or more levels, higher levels of, I, I said inequality, but I meant mobility. I'm even confusing the two now. Um, you have higher level, more mobility going on in the middle. Working class kids growing up and becoming middle class. Middle class kids maybe growing up and becoming working class things like this. And then again, over here, when we get to the highest earners, that IGE creeps back up. And down here, what that means is that our children of our lowest earners are unable to move up. And it also means that the children of our highest earners are not able to move down. Okay, subsequent research um, by Stanford's Pablo Mitnick and David Gruski um, use larger data sets that have spanned many years and have since found that there is even more income persistence than we previously thought. Um, when we look at the US as a whole, I said the US has average rates of mobility, so our IGE is around 0.4 which means that 40% of parental income differences show up in children's adult income. But this new research by Gruski and Mitnick um, estimates an average IGE of 0.52 for men and 0.47 for women, which is interesting showing that there's a gender difference. Other research has also demonstrated how mobility varies by race as well. The other more recent finding is that there's actually more stickiness than we see here at the top. We then, then is shown using this data. So here they're only reporting incomes. They're not reporting um, other types like earnings, other types of income that wealthy people have. Um, and so there's even more stickiness actually at the top than the bottom. And this is something that we have come to call the glass floor, um, which means that children of the super elite, right, children of one percenters, they can see the bottom, but they can't, they can't get there. They're fully protected. So this means that there's very little upward mobility for children born to the poorest families and even less downward mobility for children born to the wealthiest. So this questions the idea of meritocracy. Um, it's also important to note, as I highlighted on those maps, that mobility also varies by region. Um, the Economist actually published an article that's called, are you from a launch pad or a swamp? And I think you can sort of determine that meaning. Um, academics have used nicer terms talking about areas have being sticky or magnetic. Okay, so finally, I want to show you something that's known as the Great Gatsby Curve. Um, this plots the amount of, so we've been in this whole lecture, we've been talking about inequality and mobility. And this, the Great Gatsby Curve, uses both. So down here, we have a measure of inequality in a society. And here we have a measure of mobility using IGE. Okay, so this down here, we have the Gini coefficient. It is also a number between zero and one, whereas zero means you have perfect equality. Everybody has the same every income. And one means maximum inequality where like one person has all the income and everybody else has nothing. So obviously there's no zeros and there's no ones. Um, most people, most nations lie in the middle. Um, this curve coined the Great Gatsby Curve by Alan Kruger, who's an American economist, plots the Gini 
index with IgE. Um, and so for both of these, high numbers are bad. And so you can see where the US lies. We're fairly high on the inequality index and we're fairly high on the, on, for IgE, which means we have low rates of mobility. So especially you compare us to other countries like Canada, Finland, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Japan, Germany, um, UK, right? We are sort of an outlier here. Um, so obviously the name refers to the novel, The Great Gatsby, where Gatsby went from being a bootlegger to a millionaire. Um, so using this data, it's interesting because um, we can safely say, we know that Americans are not actually okay with this much inequality. Um, so how do we solve this problem then? And I think this is, this is one of the first questions that we have um, is what, what can be done about this? And one thing that you're probably her hearing right now is wealth tax, right? Wealth tax, wealth tax, wealth tax is everywhere. Now it sounds really great. If we just tax 5%, 1% tax on Americans billionaires, we could get this much money and it would solve all our problems. Um, it's important to note that it is more complicated than that. I know it sounds wonderful, right? Because probably none of us here are billionaires. And so we'll just say like, yeah, just tax those people and everything will be wonderful. But there are issues with that. Um, there, some scholars argue that we cannot solve this issue until we get rid of um, inheritance. That the fact that the wealthiest Americans hand down inheritance, right? So um, sometimes it's called the death tax, right? Where, um, and it, it goes back and forth, it varies by state, but the tax that um, children pay on inheriting from their parents. And, in, and a lot of Americans do not support inheritance taxes, which is interesting because most Americans will not receive an inheritance from their parents. I know I won't. <laughs> I've got a ton of siblings. And um, <laughs> so I guess it's easy for me to, to support something like an inheritance tax because I'm not getting anything. Um, education. Uh, research has found that education is the key factor in mobility. Um, and I'm guessing this is why some of you are probably attending college. We know that um, it's not guaranteed, of course, nothing is guaranteed, but education is the key factor in mobility. That if you are able to get more education, right? People with college degrees we know have higher earnings, they have higher quality of life, they have lower divorce rates, all of this is well documented. Um, and I also just want to leave, um, leave you with this idea that in the US, we often don't talk about social class, right? I think because we do have this idea of this perception of America as being this land of equal opportunity, um, we sort of, social class is not a protected status, right? It's not something we talk about that much, right? So. Um, but it is a very important issue um, because, you know, many people believe that if you are poor, it just means that you didn't work hard enough. And I'm hoping that today I've shown that that is just not true. And that's all I have for you. And I'm sorry, I think I went a little long. Um, yes, I do have a link. Okay, so I think I answered there is so the first so we can open it up for um, Q and A, and um, so I think I answered try and find higher inequality for some proposals. Okay, so um, I think I sort of answered this question. Um, is that there are plans, right? So I, when Elizabeth Warren was running for president, a, a lot of her plan had to do with taxing billionaires. That was sort of her, her soundbite. And again, this plan is, although it sounds great, it is not without its problems. So, um, and I'm not saying it wouldn't work or it would work 100%, but it's just, it's more, again, most things are more complicated than they, than they appear. Um, but yes, I think, so one, um, actually for the person who asked this question, if I can give a recommendation, there's a, like the best book that I've ever read by anybody was written by a sociologist and maybe I'm a little biased, but it's a book called Evicted by Matthew Desmond and I assign it in one of my classes. 
and there are so also you know there are things designed to help with this inequality right student debt relief um there's you know all these sorts of plans we have um programs to help people get jobs, programs to help people get job training, programs for childcare. But Matthew Desmond argues that none of this matters if we can't get people um, quality housing, affordable quality housing. And for most of us being Californians, um, this is, you know, this is something that we face very much. Uh, there is not enough housing. There is no affordable housing. Um, and so the housing crisis is, is very much felt here in California, but it is felt all over the US. And so Matthew Desmond argues, you can give somebody welfare, you could give somebody all sorts of things, but if they don't have reliable housing, right, if they are moving every month or every six months, then then you're not actually helping them. That housing, getting people affordable housing is actually the key to solving um, this, this crisis, right? This inequality that children growing up in unstable housing are not able, right, to go to school or do well in school or enroll in college. Um, and for the next question, I do have a link for that that I can send. Um, Jane, I can I can send it to you and maybe, I don't have it to post like right at my fingertips, but I, I'd be happy to send it. It's this really cool website with all these mobility nerds. And I've basically been living there this whole week <laughs> preparing for this lecture. Um, where does the government put most of its resources into? Can the government afford to allocate its funding? So this question is, where does the government put most of its resources into? Can the government afford to allocate its funding and spending to welfare for people in poverty? So that is debatable. You can actually, I don't know the numbers exactly, but this is something that is definitely, we, you could look up. How much money does the US spend on military? How much money does the US spend on defense? How much, people, how much money does the US spend on infrastructure? Um, all of these, I don't know off the top of my head, but that it's definitely something that we could look up. And, you know, I think some people would say that the government can't afford to allocate more spending for people in poverty, but I would say that we can't afford not to. Um, and there's all sorts of data on um, that when we, that the government ends up spending more money long run, right, if people don't have health insurance, if people can't pay their bills, if people are going bankrupt. So I think, again, this is something that's up for debate, but I would say that I would argue that it should be a, a priority for the government. So um, these are great questions. Do we have um, any other does anybody else have any other questions? Okay, if, it, if nobody else has any other questions, um, Jane, I'm not sure. <laughs> Zoom things can be so awkward. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that you know? closing. Um, so first off, thank you. That was illuminating. Um, that was a really, really wonderful talk. I know I learned a lot um, and I've got some things to look into, some articles to read, and I think that's really great. So I'm super appreciative of your time. Um, to those of you who joined us tonight, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your questions. Um, I did share my email in the Q&A. If any of you are interested in those links and those resources, send me an email and I'm happy to share that. Um, we did record this session as well. And so within, I would say maybe by Monday, you can expect that it'll be up on our YouTube channel. So if you wanna rewatch it and go check out those resources, you will absolutely have access to it. So with that being said, we can go ahead and wrap up. So thank you all again. I hope you all have a great rest of your night. And for the attendees, hopefully we'll be hearing from you soon. Good night, everyone. Thank you.